Imagine a microchip powered by air, a walking ring oscillator. Today we'll print transistors and resistors, running on vacuum, and turn them into a nervous system, powered by air. Over the last few months we've built a little zoo of squishy robots, a snake that slithered and crawled, a first walker, and then combine these two into a more agile salamander robot. They all move with soft vacuum powered muscles. Air flows through tiny channels inside their bodies, but the signals that drive them still come from the outside. A bulky tangle of pumps and valves. In the last video we explored the world of microfluidics and gave our robot a mechanical brain that controls its steps. This time we're going further. The closest thing humans have made to artificial brains are microchips. Hidden inside the black epoxy packaging, tiny electronic circuits etched into silicon. And they start out as these thin slices called wafers. But today we're building a very different kind of chip. One that uses a wafer made from squishy silicone and runs on vacuum. There's actually quite a bit of research on air-powered logic circuits. They're usually meant to control pumps and valves, shrinking entire labs onto a single chip. Let's take that idea. But instead of moving tiny droplets of a liquid in a lab, we'll use it to control the muscles of our squishy robots. If you dive into the research, one circuit shows up again and again. The ring oscillator. It's a classic from electronics, like this LED chaser. At its core, it's a chain of inverters that produce rhythmic output. And what is an inverter? It's a little logic gate that flips the signal. To build one, we need a transistor and a resistor. But for air, can we build an air-powered ring oscillator? A nervous system for our squishy robots? These circuits are usually built with fancy clean room techniques. All I've got is a desktop 3D printer at the end of my hallway. So to make this work, we need to get creative and use some tricks. Let's start with our squishy wafer. It's cast from silicone. I added a little orange pigment just for fun. Using a scale keeps the membrane thickness consistent. Once cured, try not to touch the surface. It needs to stay pristine. Place a mask and cut out a little square. Also punch some holes. Those will come in handy later. And here's the first trick. Positive pressure blows the membrane open. While vacuum pulls it tighter. It's self-sealing. That's what makes the whole system work. In electronics we think of two poles. Positive and negative. Connect them and electricity flows through the wire. In our circuits, we don't use plus and minus. We use atmosphere, the pressure of the air around us, and vacuum provided by this pump. Air flows through the tube, just like electrons in a wire. That flow of air is what we'll use to build circuits. In electronic logic, one of the most crucial components is the transistor. At its core, it's really just a valve for electrons. In our air-powered version, it looks like this. Two channels divided by a wall. Below them, another channel. And sandwiched between them, the squishy membrane. With the solid bodies in place, you can see the three-layer architecture. On top sits the flow layer, in the middle, the squishy membrane, and on the bottom, the control layer. Let's have a look at the cross-section. With atmosphere in the control channel, the membrane stays flat. The flow seals itself. That's off. Switch the control to vacuum and the membrane pulls down. The path opens. Flow moves across. That's on. It's basically a normally closed valve you can control using air pressure. To finish the design we add screw holes and ports to access the channels. The trick to make this actually printable is to scale the channels up about five times compared to the literature. And as a bonus, this gives us more flow for powering the muscle. 
a 0.2mm nozzle is necessary to print the fine details. Another key trick is to make use of the smooth build plate. This creates a perfect interface for sealing against the membrane. Let's start with the control layer. To access the channel we hammer in a blunt needle. A quick dab with tape pulls off any dust so the membrane bonds cleanly. Now if we place the membrane on the smooth surface it sticks just by itself. Connect it and the vacuum pulls the membrane into the control layer. It looks simple, but this is crucial. Where silicon wafers rely on semiconductor properties, our squishy wafer relies on its elasticity. Let's add the flow layer, first hammering in the blunt needles, then another dab with tape, and finally stacking all the layers. The stack sticks together by itself, but adding screws keeps everything aligned. By placing a T-connector between the transistor and the vacuum supply, it acts like a simple switch. Cover the opening and vacuum flexes the membrane. You can see it brighten as it opens. In digital logic everything comes down to bits, zeros and ones. In our air-powered logic these correspond to different pressure levels. Atmospheric pressure is zero. Vacuum is one. To show the pressure, I took these muscles from the legs of the salamander. It's literally a bit. Relaxed is zero. Pulled down by vacuum is one. When we connect our transistor to the muscle like this, it contracts. That's because the transistor is normally closed. Now, if we connect our little vacuum switch, we can open and close the transistor and the muscle starts moving. With this transistor we can already build simple logic gates, the basic building blocks of computers. In electronics, resistors slow down the flow of electrons. In our air logic we can use thin tubes to slow down the flow of air. You can feel it. Push air through a big opening and it's easy. Push through a tiny opening and you really have to work for it. To put numbers on resistance we're using a simple test rig. The sensor compares pressure against atmosphere. To the sensor we attach a T-connector. One side connects to the vacuum pump, the other stays open to atmosphere. With that setup, atmosphere overpowers the pump and you read a pressure difference of zero. Seal it completely and the pump pulls down to its maximum, minus 57 kilopascals. That's our 100% vacuum point. Now let's connect that tiny tube flow in from atmosphere and the pull from the pump balance out at about minus 41 kilopascal. That pressure drop across the tube can be used as a proxy for resistance. But can we print resistances? I tried it with two channels, both 10 mm long. One with a 1 by 1 mm square cross section, the other just 0.5 by 0.5 mm. The 1 mm channel had low resistance the 0.5mm channel had much higher resistance. To land in between, I printed a 0.6mm channel. Resistance can be tuned directly through geometry. And with resistors and transistors, we now have the core building blocks for our vacuum logic. Now let's build an inverter. It flips the signal. Input 0, output 1. Input 1, output 0. That's all. Here's the design. Inside you can already spot a resistor and a transistor. The inverter has four connections. Vacuum in, atmosphere, an input to control the transistor and an output. When the input is zero, atmosphere, the transistor stays closed. Vacuum flows through the resistor and the output goes to one. But when the input is one, vacuum, the transistor opens. Now vacuum and atmosphere both fight for the output. But since vacuum has to go through that tiny resistor, atmosphere wins and the output flips to zero. As before we print the rigid channels, cut out a little rectangle from our squishy wafer and assemble the full stack. 
Now let's test it. It flips the signal. It works. What happens if you chain two inverters together? One muscle relaxes, then the other contracts. The signal propagates. Now let's add a third inverter, connecting the loop back onto itself. The muscles start to move all on their own. The circuit comes alive. A little shy at first, but yes, it's oscillating. Now let's get rid of all these bulky tubes and build a fully integrated ring oscillator. Let's go big. Five inverters. Each output feeding the next input. To make that connection, signals have to cross the membrane. So I added little holes, like vias in a circuit board. Each inverter has its own outlet to drive a squishy muscle. You can see all the tiny resistors and transistors inside. Once again, I assembled the full stack. Here it is, a vacuum driven 5 stage ring oscillator. Attach the muscles, then connect the vacuum supply and it starts oscillating. For this large circuit I used clamps to press it together. And if you watch closely, there is a pattern. Every second muscle moves together. At first this puzzled me, until I realized the signals aren't just delayed, they are also inverted. So I redesigned the layout, rearranged the outputs and rotated the muscle base sideways. And here it is. I swapped out the vacuum pump with a stronger one. Now let's connect it. It works. A smooth traveling wave. Think about it. The motion is created entirely by our integrated vacuum logic circuit. But will it work? Let's try. It's moving, but doesn't really go forward, so I turned the oscillator around. At first glance, both waves look the same, but there's a subtle difference. And only one of them can walk. Air-powered legs, driven by an air-powered nervous system. A big step toward integrated control for our squishy robots. Or should I say, many tiny steps? I tried powering it with a syringe. With each pull, it walks forward a few steps. Watching the legs ripple in sequence, it reminds me of a caterpillar, maybe even a centipede. What do you think? What kind of robot should I build with this? Let me know in the comments. There's still a way to go before this becomes a full nervous system for our salamander robot, but this is just the beginning. Making this video took a lot of time, so if you enjoyed it, consider subscribing. Thanks for watching and stay soft.